Dallas, Texas. Via satellite, this is Point of View. The talk show that's different. Featuring interviews, issue discussions, and phone calls from across the nation. And now, here's your host, Marlon Maddox. I've got in my hand a pamphlet that is put out by an organization called, uh, let's see, Center for Judaic Christian Studies. And they say Jesus was not a Christian, he was a Jew. He spoke Hebrew and lived solely within the Jewish culture of first century Israel. The apostles and all his early followers were Jews. Even the New Testament is essentially a Jewish document in that its composition and orientation reflect a perspective of life and the world that is thoroughly Hebraic. As followers of Jesus of Nazareth, then our Hebrew heritage is rich and full. The Center for Judaic Christian Studies is restoring to Christians an awareness of their heritage and the benefits of a Hebraic perspective on their faith. To discuss that with us is Dr. Roy Blizzard. He's head of research for the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. A little background on Dr. Blizzard. He's a specialist on Israel and the Middle East from 1968 to 1974. He was an instructor in Hebrew, biblical history, and biblical archaeology at the University of Texas at Austin. He has an M.A. degree from Eastern New Mexico University in Portales, New Mexico, an M.A. degree from the University of Texas at Austin, a Ph.D. in Hebrew studies from the University of Texas at Austin. He studied at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel, in the summer of 1966. He spent much of his time in that country in study and research. He's an archaeologist, and uh, he's led a lot of uh, groups digging in Israel for something. What are you digging for, Roy? <laughs> well, we really didn't know, uh, Marlon, when we started out our digging. You know, um, it's an interesting thing about archaeology. You don't just start out by saying, well, we're going out here and find the Ark find of the Covenant so, today. Yeah. Uh, we find a, a site that looks interesting, and then we uh, begin our digging. But frankly, I have been associated with two of the most exciting archaeological excavations in Israel uh, in uh, recent times. One of them being, of course, the excavations at the Temple Mount mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. where we made some very startling uh, archaeological discoveries. And then a small, uh, seemingly insignificant site that no one will recognize when I mention the name, because it has no biblical connection insofar as we know, known as Tel Kesila. Mm -hmm. But there we uh, found in 1972 a Philistine temple that dates from 1200 B.C. Now that's 200 years before King David. Wow. And about the time the Israelites were mm -hmm. entering into and settling the land, and in this Canaanite, or uh, excuse me, Philistine temple, we found artifacts that indicated to us the nature of the whole Canaanite religious system of that day. And these artifacts were completely unique, had to do with the uh, specific uh, cult uh, uh, that was uh, what, currently... What, uh, okay, what did you find as to their religious system? What did they worship? What did they believe? Well, the interesting thing about it is, and the bottom line is, that they were uh, Satan worshipers. Occultism. Cult, yeah. yes. Yeah. The uh, artifacts were, in many instances, purely pornographic. It's almost impossible to talk about them in a mixed audience. Uh, they You're were, talking sexual. Uh, yes. Gross, is that right? Gross uh, representations well, you'll see of this. male and female sex. Right, you'll see the you'll see the same things on temples in India. Exactly. And you're saying exactly. the same thing exactly. 1,200 years before yes, Christ. Yes, yes, exactly. Wow. And this temple, interestingly enough, was probably destroyed by David in his uh, conquests of the land. Mm -hmm. But uh, the things that we found were so uh, unique that none of the archaeologists in the country had ever seen anything like them before. And many of the artifacts remain as part of the permanent exhibition at the Hebrew Museum in Jerusalem because of the uniqueness of the artifacts. When you go and uh, excavate and find something like that uh, and see the very definite tie-in of the Canaanites to Satan worship and the occult, 
Does that uh, give you a better understanding of why God told them to destroy the Canaanites? Oh, absolutely. All the absolutely. You see, I taught uh, the subject of biblical archaeology at the University of Texas for a number of years, and one of the questions that I was most frequently asked by my students was, how could a God who's supposed God to be a good this? God, yeah, a God yeah. of justice and mercy, uh, command the children of Israel to annihilate the Canaanites? Mm -hmm. Well... Uh, we pondered that for a number of years, but today archaeologists who are knowledgeable in the field, not only of archaeological but of textual studies as well, uh, wonder why God waited as long as he did. Mm. Dr. Roy Blizzard is my guest. Uh, Roy, you are associated with uh, the organization called Center for Judeo-Christian Studies. Uh, can you give us an overview of what this is and its purpose? Well, yes, uh, Marlon, I can, and I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about them. I'm very excited about the organization. It's just recently formed within the last few years. But uh, our purpose has been basically to bring together all of the top scholars in this country and in Israel in the field of historical, archaeological, and textual studies to publish the material of our current researches that are underway principally in Israel and to get this information out to the people to inform them of the Hebraic background of the biblical text mm -hmm. to try to move the people of God and when I say that I'm talking about all denominations it's mm -hmm. a trans-denominational organization yeah. move them back of Protestantism back of Catholicism back of the Gentile church of the second third centuries and following and back to the Hebraic roots, if you will, or the Hebraic foundations of our faith and begin to see things from a correct biblical perspective, which is, of course, rooted very firmly in the Judaism in Israel, Jerusalem, Judea in the first century. Why? Why, why should we be concerned about uh, Hebraic and Jewish roots? Well, uh, that is a very pertinent question. Why? For the simple reason that the biblical text is a Jewish document. The language in which it was written, and we're talking about the Old Testament, and this is going to be a surprise to many of our listeners, much of the new, was written in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Now... A lot of our listeners learned when they were studying or going to church or Bible school or wherever that uh, the New Testament was written in Greek mm -hmm. and that Jesus spoke Aramaic or some have even thought that he spoke Greek. But today we know that the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, were a part of an original Hebrew life story of Jesus that was probably written by Matthew because that's the oldest of the patristic evidence that we have dating back almost to the first century as a matter of fact that it was written by Matthew in Hebrew now Hebrew being a Semitic language is very difficult to translate into Greek mm -hmm. or into English or any other language for that matter and retain the uh, idiom or the uh, depth of meaning of uh, the words that were spoken by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And once we see Jesus as a Jew, as a rabbi, understand uh, the language in which he taught, understand how he taught, and we know today a lot about the rabbinic methods of the itinerating rabbi of Jesus' day, it illuminates uh, the words of Jesus to an unbelievable degree. Let's, uh, let, let's go back. Let's talk about Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, as you approach him as being a rabbi, a Jewish teacher, perhaps speaking Hebrew or however, uh, what are some of the things that you found that may be a little bit different than standard uh, belief about him? Just almost everything. All right. Who was this Jesus then? Uh, when we look at Jesus as a rabbi, uh, of course, most people, I think, have a difficult time understanding, first of all, that he was a Jew. When we see him as a rabbi, we have to understand that 
as a rabbi in his day, the function of the rabbi had not become formalized or stabilized as it did later on in Judaism, especially after the destruction of the temple. What we see as a rabbi in Jesus' day is an itinerating, uh, peripatetic uh, individual who is wandering from place to place. Almost an evangelist, uh, uh, this type yeah, of evangelistic we would, teacher we, or we something? Could, we could call it that way, but it's not so much evangelism right. as it is teaching. When we think of evangelism, we're talking more about the proclamation okay. of the gospel to those who are lost. Okay. Whereas he is instructing those who are a part of the family of God into what is correct Christ, uh, correct uh, uh, living before God. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about all of these great themes of the Bible, the nature of God and the nature of man and the relationship of man to man, the brotherhood of God and uh, br brotherhood of man and etc. All of these great uh, uh, themes of the Bible. Later on in Judaism, after the destruction of the temple, the concentration is more on law or mm -hmm. halakha, as it's called in Judaism, whereas in Jesus' day, the concentration is on Haggadah, that is full of parable and homily and simile and metaphor and allegory. Are you saying there were other young rabbis or rabbis doing the same thing hundreds Jesus of, was doing? Hundreds so of them. So he was not unusual he in that sense? He was not unusual in that what, sense at all. What was unusual about him? What is unusual is his own individual interpretation of the, the scriptures. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that he has very little to say that is new. He has very little to say that uh, some rabbi before him had not already said. What he's doing is coming along and adding his unique perspective on the issue. Um, are you saying then that Jesus uh, was just a man? Oh, no, not at all. Okay. Dr. Roy Blizzard is my guest, and he's head of research for the Center for Judaic Christian Studies, and you're listening to Point of View. One of the books uh, that Dr. Blizzard has written is called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus, New Insights from a Hebraic Perspective. And uh, I'm going to be asking him about that as well as a lot of other things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. We're going to take some time out and let the local stations bring you some very important messages so you listen up and then come back. Dr. Roy Blizzard, my guest. Um, Roy, speaking about Jesus as being a rabbi, and you said during that time there were hundreds of other young itinerant teachers uh, like him. And then uh, again, you mentioned that a lot of the things that he had to say, probably many of the other rabbis were saying at the same time. Can you give us an illustration of what you mean by that? And then perhaps we can discuss what was different about him. Well, there were... Uh, many rabbis mm -hmm. uh, in his day, hundreds of them, literally, that were commenting on the Old Testament and uh, other rabbinic literature, with which most of our listeners probably are not familiar, known as the Mishnah. Okay. Now, this was the oral law that was considered by the Jews as being on a par with the written law and was considered also to have been given to Moses at Sinai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this was not written down until 200 A.D., but in Jesus' day, it was a part of what we call Mishnahic and then later on rabbinic literature. And it had to do with human relationships, all kinds of subjects. What is it called subjects. today? It's called the Mishnah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, they dealt with such issues as uh, uh, betrothal and marriage and divorce and uh, all kinds of laws of uh, purification and so on and so forth. And in Jesus' day, there were other great teachers such as uh, Hillel, for example, and Shammai, who were constantly coming in conflict with one another in their interpretation of law. And I'll give you just one example. Uh, you remember the subject, uh, the incident in the biblical text of the woman taken in adultery. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Jewish law, just the literal interpretation of law is that a woman taken in adultery should be stoned or mm -hmm. put to death. Mm -hmm. So the punishment was death. Now, Hillel, representing the more moderate school, would have looked at this woman that they were preparing to stone that had been taken in adultery 
and uh, would have said, well, wait a minute, before we stone her, maybe there's some extenuating circumstances. Uh, maybe her husband is not fulfilling his conjugal responsibilities, mm -hmm. which are specifically spelled out in law. Mm -hmm. According to Jewish law, a man was required by law to have sexual relationships with his wife so many times per week based on his profession. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but he was required to satisfy her in it. Maybe he wasn't fulfilling his conjugal responsibilities. He was also required by law not to be mentally or physically cruel to his wife. It was a just cause for a woman to appeal to a rabbinic court and be granted a, a bill of divorcement. Maybe there were some extenuating circumstances. The school of Shammai, on the other hand, represented the legalistic school. Shammai would have said, go ahead and stone her. Mm -hmm. Now, in Jesus' day, it was almost impossible for a man to, shall we say, commit adultery, because he was allowed a multiplicity of wives, he was allowed concubines, uh, sub-wives, mm -hmm. and uh, adultery was something basically that women did, and it was the violation of another man's personal property. Jesus comes along, and in the midst of this situation, where you have Hillel saying, maybe there's extenuating circumstances, Shammai saying stoner, Jesus just stoops down and writes something in the dust. And I can almost tell you 100% for sure what he wrote. What did he write? Lo lin of. What does that mean? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. And then he looked up at these hypocrites, the... Uh, spiritual leaders of his day and said, now whichever one of you has not done this already, mm -hmm. you throw the first stone. Mm -hmm. And what happened? They turned around and all walked home. You see what happens is he's adding this peculiar, unique dimension into something that they're already uh, talking about that's an interpretation of law. He comes along and gives his unique interpretation, which is the idealistic uh, and shall we say, the correct interpretation. Was, uh, was Jesus the Son of God? Uh, in the sense in which you say it, no. Okay. The interesting thing about it is that the term Son of God is not a Hebraic term. All right. What is it? Uh, son of God is a, a, a Greek term or a Hellenistic term. Jesus nowhere calls himself Son of God. Okay. And uh, you will not find this term in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus refers to himself as son of man. Okay. Now, before I can explain that to you, I need also to explain the rabbinic method of teaching in Jesus' day. You see, in Jesus' day, uh, we know the whole educational process. A lot of people wonder, well, what did Jesus do in these silent years bef between the time we see him in the temple and the time we see him at 30, and we know exactly what he was doing, because at five years of age, they begin to study the Scripture and then they continued studying the Talmud and the Mishnah and they worked all of the way through so that by the time they were of the age for Bar Mitzvah at the age of 13 to become a son of the covenant, the responsibilities of the law on them, they already had the scriptures memorized. Now, back then, they didn't have books as we have them today, only manuscripts. They were all written by hand. They were very valuable, and maybe they only had one, and they committed all of this material to memory. Now, Jesus uses a method of instruction or teaching that is, and this is of the utmost importance to our understanding of what Jesus is having to say about himself, his whole uh, method of teaching, that we might call illusion. In Hebrew, it's remez, in which he's always hinting back at something in the Old Testament. And he might just use a word or a phrase or a sentence, but this is a key word or a phrase or sentence, and because these people have all of this material committed to memory, when he speaks this word or phrase, literally there is an explosion in their mind of the whole passage, the whole theology, if you will, concerning this particular subject. Now, Jesus, when he refers to himself as the Son of Man, is making a direct reference back to Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, when it talks about the one who comes before the Ancient of Days, mm -hmm. and who's presented to the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion and power and authority, and of whose kingdom there should be no end, the most supernatural figure in the entire 
biblical text. And when he uses this term and he calls himself, himself son of man, yes. okay. immediately the Jews identify him as being not son of God, but God himself. Wow. Jesus... Just by that reference. Yes. Jesus always, in everything that he says, and even little things that he does, is making claims of divinity for himself. And you remember, that's what ultimately gets him into trouble. That's right. That's right. It's what ultimately gets him killed. So He's you're saying, basically, a Marlon Maddox is somebody not knowing this... Uh, could read where he says son of man I always just assume that that meant I'm flesh and blood. They talked about the humanism yeah. or the humanity I'm, I'm of Jesus. Human and exactly. After all, hey, I'll, yes. uh, you know, yes. I'm just a yes. member of the human yes. race. Yes, but that's, but that's not right. Yeah. He, when he makes that statement, that is a he says I'm powerful God. declaration that he is God. Wow. And the Jews who hear him understand exactly what he's talking about. And when he uses a term, for example, uh, Marlon, like uh, the son of man hath come to see seek and to save that which was lost. Yeah. Immediately, these Jews tie together two powerful passages of Scripture. One of them in Daniel, of course, Daniel uh, 7, uh, 13 and 14, but another one in Ezekiel chapter 34. And this is a uh, let me Let me give you an interpretation that most of us are taught. If a guy wants to be very liberal, humanistic, he refers to Jesus, he said, Hey, I'm son of man. Son of man right. I'm just a man. Yeah. You're kind He's of blowing He's just a good that. moral teacher. You're, you're blowing that to smithereens. I mean, this... No, you're, I, you're, you're saying that's a, more, that's a stronger statement uh, than... Than to uh, say he's son of than God. Than he's son of God. Absolutely. Yeah. He is claiming to be nothing less than God himself. Wow. And uh, let me show you this in Ezekiel chapter 34. This is the remez or the illusion uh, back to which he is hinting. He says, For thus says the Lord to God, Behold, I... I myself, this is God speaking, will search out for my sheep. I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his sheep in the day that he's scattered among the, his flock that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. I will rescue. That's the save. Seek, save. So when he says the Son of Man had come to seek and to save, they link these two passages together mm -hmm. and they understand mm -hmm. immediately that he's declaring himself to be God. Wow. And all of the way through, you can see this happening over and over again is, in uh, everything that he says. Okay, is is this a lead-in to the book, perhaps, uh, that you and David Biven have written, Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus? Uh, not so much as lead-in into the nature of Jesus. I mean, is that an illustration of it, or...? Or not, or not? No, okay. not, not really. All right. The book, Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus, was written for one reason and one reason alone, and that was to establish that Hebrew, and not Aramaic and not Greek, was the language of Jesus and was the language in which the original life story of Jesus was communicated. You're saying the Gospels were written in Hebrew first? That's correct. And then the translated synoptic into Gospels, synoptic? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right. And then translated into and Aramaic? And then translated slavishly, literally, into Greek. All right. Into Greek. All into right. Greek, yes. Right. And uh, so slavishly, literally, as a matter of fact, that it retains all of the Hebrew idioms. We've never really taken careful note of this as we look at the Greek text, but anyone who knows anything at all about Greek knows that the Greek of the Synoptic Gospels is terrible Greek. It's horrible Greek. And the classical Greek scholars have always called the Greek of the Synoptic Gospels Holy Ghost Greek because it's such poor Greek. But they've never, anyone ever come along and said, well, the reason why is because this is not Greek. It's mm -hmm. actually Hebrew in Greek dress. Okay. And you can take this Greek that so perfectly preserves for us the Hebrew idiom and translate it back into Hebrew that is so literal that you don't even have to interrupt the the syntax or the order of are the there are there documents that substantiate this have you has anybody found hebrew copies no, no we have not found any hebrew copies right. but you must keep in mind at the same time that we do not have any greek manuscripts that predate the fourth century none of the original signatures i think they uh, well autograph copies autograph, I'm sorry. Uh, but of course if we had an autograph copy of the original life story 
it would be Hebrew. Okay. But we have no Greek manuscripts that predate the 4th century. You mentioned the Hebrew idioms. Explain what the idioms mean and give us some illustrations of what you're talking about. Well, let's talk about a very common idiom, right. uh, a very important passage, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount. All right. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 20 and following, you remember where Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where mm -hmm. moth and rust going to corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay mm -hmm. up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, that's... Tell you what, hang on question. to that. I, I want to hear about that. Uh, you're listening to Point of View. Dr. Roy Blizzard is my guest, and he's head of research for the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. I hope he stimulates some of your thinking, and later on in the broadcast, we'll open the phone lines and give you a chance to ask him some questions. He's a specialist on Israel and the Middle East. He's an archaeologist, and from some of that work, uh, he's discovered some things that he's sharing with us today. We'll be right back. Please enclose your love offering to the ministry when you write. Now, here again is Marlon. And I'm talking to Dr. Roy Blizzard. He's head of research for the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. He's been over into Israel on some historical archaeological study seminars in Israel. Uh, before the break, uh, Roy, I was asking you about uh, Hebrew idioms to, to tell us what an idiom is and perhaps give us some illustrations of what you're talking about. Well, an idiom is a saying, of course, uh, such as we would use in English, uh, he hit the ceiling, Okay. which uh, means that he was mad All right. or that he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, which okay. means that he was uh, well-to-do. Uh, and we have all kinds of idioms in English uh, similar to these, and I think the people can, just with these two illustrations, understand how uh, we use them all the time in our daily expression. The Jews did the same thing. They had all kinds of idioms and expressions that they used that were meaningless when we translate them into Greek. Okay. For example... If we translate it into Russian or something, he hit the ceiling, uh, all we see is a guy hitting the that, ceiling. That's right. Would mean nothing Exactly. Else. Okay, exactly. I see what you mean. Exactly. Or if he's born with a silver... silver what would it mean? Uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, now... There's one passage, and I would like to invite the people who are listening, if they would just run real quick and get a Bible and turn and follow uh, some of these passages. And they'll, if they have several Bibles, they can open them all up at once and see how varied the translators translate this one passage because they don't understand what's going on. But in uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, Jesus is talking about don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust is going to corrupt and thieves break through and steal and so on and so forth. But uh, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then he says in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then in verse 22, he says, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if thine eye be single... Thy whole body is full of light, but if thy eye be evil, thy whole body is full of darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been a believer and I uh, think a pastor for many years in your life. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a single eye? I really don't know. I think it would mean purpose. How many times have you heard somebody get up and talk about, well, we have to Single be minded. single mindedness yeah. okay. and singleness of purpose and et cetera mm -hmm. and et cetera? Doesn't have anything to do with that at all. If you look in uh, several translations, you'll see it's translated as whole eye or clear eye or healthy eye or pure eye or sound eye or good eye. Now, good eye is probably as good a translation as you can get in English, but when you translate it good eye in English, it's still meaningless, meaningless. because that's not a Hebrew. Uh, that's not an English idiom. Right. But Jesus is alluding back to Proverbs. Uh, actually, to several passages of Scripture in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 22, 9 for a good eye and Proverbs 23, 6 and uh, 28, 22 for a bad eye. Uh, but uh, to make a long story short, I'm just going to read to you so you won't think that old Roy is pulling this stuff out of the air someplace out of this little book here that's called Every Man's Talmud, which is a Jewish uh, book that is an 
anthology of rabbinic literature, of Mishnahic and Talmudic literature, of customs, traditions, other things. And here it's written on page 271 under folklore, obviously no superstitious notions are connected with the phrase a good eye and an evil eye. They refer to magnanimity and its reverse. And even to this day, in Hebrew, a good eye is an idiom for being generous. Hmm. And an evil eye is an idiom for being miserly or stingy. So he's talking about generosity. Yeah. Now look and see how this illuminates this whole passage. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth by being miserly and stingy, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Makes sense. By though. being a generous, giving person. For where a person's heart is, there's their treasure going to be also. And then he's referring, of course, back to many, many other passages here in Proverbs where it says, uh, the man that has the good eye is blessed because he gives mm -hmm. to the poor. And that's striking again right at the heart of what Jesus is teaching here in the responsibility that the individual has to take care of the needs of the fellow brethren. My guest, uh, Dr. Roy Blizzard, and we're talking about uh, the Hebrew background of Christianity and of Jesus. If you'd like to ask him a question, the phone lines. If you'd like to ask him a question, the phone lines are open. The title of a book that I'm looking at is called "Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus." Is that? Uh, what are a couple more that you'd consider to be difficult words of Jesus that you, in your study, have come up with an altogether different meaning? Well. Uh, as a matter of fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount uh, has been grossly misunderstood in Christendom. And you remember it begins with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for mm -hmm. theirs is the kingdom mm -hmm. of heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What is kingdom of heaven? Okay. To us, kingdom of heaven has always been pie in the sky by and by, something out there in the future. But again, Jesus, in using this term, uh, poor in spirit, is making an allusion back to a number of passages of Scripture in Isaiah 66, 2, Isaiah 57, 15, Psalms 51, 17, Psalms 34, 18. And without taking a lot of time, I'm just going to briefly explain to you what this actually means, and the people can look these passages of Scripture up. To be poor in spirit means one who has repented of their sins, who has turned to God, who loves his word, and who keeps his commandments. Now, all of this is poetry. Uh, and uh, uh, poetry, uh, as you probably know in Judaism, is uh, composed to a great extent of what we call parallelisms. Mm -hmm. And parallelisms is one of the chief characteristics of uh, Hebrew uh, prose and poetry. And what we have is just a progressive parallelistic development here in the uh, Beatitudes as Jesus is essentially just building upon one thought and saying the same thing through all of the Beatitudes that begin with blessed are. Mm -hmm. Kingdom of God for the Jew, for the rabbis, is always now. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Now, kingdom of God, I might hasten to say, is also not Hebraic. Kingdom of heaven is the way the Jews would say it because they have an aversion to using the word God. Okay. But kingdom of God is Hellenistic. It means the same thing. Kingdom okay. of God, kingdom of heaven. But it is the now. Kingdom of God are those people over whom God is ruling now. No. But further beyond that, who are demonstrating the rule of God in their lives. So blessed are those who have repented of their sins, who've turned to God, who love his word, and who keep his commandments, because these are the people over whom God is ruling, and who are demonstrating his rule in their lives. And that's poor in spirit. That's what poor in spirit. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. Okay. Dr. Roy Blizzard, my guest. Uh, let's go to the phones and, and Beach Bluff, Tennessee. Rita, hi there. Hi. Go ahead. Um, 
I want to thank you for the program today. I tried the first time and got through, and I'm elated. Great. I <laughs> um, uh, also want to thank you for the guest you have on today. He's extremely uh, interesting. What is his name? Dr. Roy Blizzard. Roy Blizzard. That's as in snowstorm. Yes. He, he just blew in this morning. <laughs> just flew in this morning. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, uh, I'd like to know two things, and I'll hang up so you can talk. All right. Uh, what is the book that you spoke of about the Talmud or something that you referred to in that one passage? Okay, what does that book give the us? The Talmud. Mode? Yes. Uh, let her go ahead and ask the other question, and we'll okay. deal with that. And also, um, if you would please go back and just briefly go through that section of your conversation where you were talking about the Son of God as opposed to the Son of Man, I missed uh, apparently the most important part that tied it all in, and I didn't understand it, and I'd like to know more about it. Okay, thank you, there. Uh, give the title of that book. Uh, All right. The book that I was referring to is uh, just a little anthology by A. Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, called Every Man's Talmud. And it's published by Shokin Books. Uh, it can be ordered through the Center for Judaic Christian Studies, which is one uh, of the we'll books that, that we keep in, in stock, and we'll just, give them the uh, address later. Okay, just briefly, Son of God, Son of Man... Uh, you don't have to go through all of it. Uh, we'll send her a copy of the tape if she wants to uh, if you, it. If, if you don't mind, it might be a good idea for me to, to explain what Talmud is, oh, okay. because go some ahead. of them may wonder, well, what is Talmud? Right. Uh, you see, Mishnah was the oral law of the Jews right. that was not written down until 200 A.D. Now, when it was written down, they began to comment on it, and the commentary on it is called the Gemara. And the collection of Mishnah and commentary, Gemara, into extensive uh, volumes of material is known as the Talmud. And yeah. it comes from the Hebrew word which means teaching or instruction. Is this, uh, th is this a scroll that's in the synagogue? Oh, no, no. Uh, that's no, the Torah? That's the Torah. Torah. Okay. Torah. That's right. the first five books of the Bible. Okay, go ahead. Uh, now, uh, Son of God, Son of Man. Son of God, as I mentioned, is not a Hebrew expression or term. Hebrews so, wouldn't say God. No, uh, Hebrews wouldn't use the term God. Okay. You see, they have an aversion to using God because of right. the commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God lightly. And uh, because of their reverence for God, they have all kinds of euphemisms that they use to say God. They'll say Hashem, which means the name, or Hamakom, which means the place, or Adonai, which means Lord, or they'll use the term Shemaim for uh, the abode of God. So uh, Malchut Shemaim, kingdom of heaven, is the Jewish way of saying kingdom of God. Okay. So when Jesus refers to himself, he never calls himself son of God. He calls himself son of man, which is a much more powerful term because it is a Hebrew expression that refers back to the most supernatural figure in the entire biblical text in Daniel chapter 7, 13, and 14, the one who appears before the Ancient of Days to whom is given power and authority and other so kingdom it, it there shall be a, no end. It's a strong word. Yes. You're listening to Point of View. My guest this afternoon, Dr. Roy Blizzard. He's head of research for the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. And uh, if you'd like to ask him a question, give us a call. You're Yes, Dr. Roy Blizzard, if you have a question, give us a call down in Tomball, Texas. Steve, hi. Hi, how you doing? Good, go ahead. Two quick short ones. Um, Matthew 27, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I get that in the Hebrew as saying, my God, my God, for this was I spared. Uh, I'd like a comment on that, and then I have another real quick one, then I'll get off the phone. Uh, if Jesus is showing his own divinity in the Son of Man discussion that you just had, would it also be fitting? Because Jesus doesn't say, when you uh, pray, say, pray in the name of Jesus. He says, pray in my name. Pray in the name of Jesus. He says, pray in my name. Would it also be... Uh, fitting to say, instead of praying in Jesus' name for a particular situation that you, you know, uh, attributing to his divinity, could you go and say, uh, in the name of Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah Nisi or Jehovah Shalom, would that also be fitting? A uh, couple of hair raisers right there for you. And I'll get off phone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
Well, there are at least interesting questions and uh, quite pertinent. First, let me say that you did not get Eli Eli Lama uh, Shavaktani, that for this I was spared from Hebrew. You got that from Aramaic and from the Lamsa a Bible that uh, translates it uh, that way, not in Aramaic uh, or not in Hebrew. Actually, this is that um, uh, says Eli Eli Lama Azaftani, which means uh, why was I forsaken? And uh, Shavach, uh, is an Aramaic term, and uh, this is found in Mark uh, when he uh, uses the term Eloi, Eloi, Lama Shavaktani. Now, the interesting thing about it is that in Mark, he goes ahead and gives himself away. Mark is kind of a Targumist. That is, he comes along and adds uh, his own Targumistic or interpretation of uh, a certain events that are taking place. And uh, he explains that as the people hear Jesus say this, they say, oh, listen, he's calling on Elijah. You remember? Now, this would have been an impossible mistake if Jesus was speaking Aramaic. Because Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, is my God, my God, and it cannot be mistaken for anything else. But the parallel passage to this in our Synoptic Gospels is in Matthew. And Matthew, when he records this event, says Eli, Eli. Now, Eli is an abbreviation or an abbreviated form of Eliyahu or Elijah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, actually, what Jesus probably said was, as Matthew has it, Eli, Eli, Lama Azaftani, which is the way in which it is uh, presented to us in the Psalms. Okay, the other question. Uh, had to do with praying in the name of Jesus. Uh, actually, uh, this is a, a most important uh, subject, a, a very pertinent question, and one that I wish that we had time to go uh, into a great uh, deal of uh, a discussion on uh, the subject of the whole nature of God, which has been greatly misunderstood in Christian circles. You see, uh, God is mentioned in the biblical text by at least 30 different names, of which Yeshuat Elohim is just one. You remember in Luke chapter 3 and verse 6, it says in English, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Well, that really doesn't have a lot of impact or import. But when you see it in Hebrew, it says, all flesh shall see Yeshuat Elohim. Well, this is just like he was mentioning Adonai Elohim or Yehovah Yireh uh, or Yahweh Yireh, uh, the uh, omniscience of God. All of these refer to some aspect the of God's being, the characteristics, aspect, yeah. the okay. nature of God, mm -hmm. and uh, Yeshuat Elohim was just one of those aspects, the saving or redemptive aspect. You shall call his name Yeshua because he's going to Yoshia, his people from their sins. You'll call his name Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. And so we see in the person of Yeshuat Elohim, God God redeeming or reconciling the world unto himself. Ken, uh, we, we have a lot of Jewish people who listen to this broadcast. I get mail from them. And uh, they say, I'm not a Christian, and I don't, don't agree with a lot you say, but, uh, you know, you're doing a good work for America, this kind of a thing. Um, if do, do Jewish people sometimes look at Jesus through the eyes of the Western Christian rather than the eyes of uh, the, the ancient Hebrew? Oh, absolutely, you see, and this is the big problem. This is the thing that we're trying to counteract in uh, the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. Uh -huh. uh, let me say this, Marlon. Uh, people, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Jewish people may uh, disagree with some of the things you say. I don't know what you say. Mm -hmm. 
but I do know what Christendom says, right. and they have every right to disagree, because much of what Christendom has said for the last 1,800 years has been very, very wrong. We've westernized Jesus of Nazareth. Hellenized. Forgetting that he is exactly. Jewish, came out of this rabbinical exactly. system. But not just that. We have forgotten that everyone who follows after him, who has accepted him as the fulfillment of the messianic hopes that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is also a Jew. Mm -hmm. A wild olive branch grafted into the natural olive tree. You remember Paul when he wrote to Gentiles. Now the word Gentile means a pagan. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote to those who were pagans that had accepted Jesus as Messiah, he said, you who were once Gentiles pagans, mm -hmm. who were once afar off, who were once alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, have now, through the blood of Christ, been brought nigh. Been brought nigh to what? Been brought nigh to Judaism. Mm -hmm. You see, in Jesus' the day, there were only two classes of people. Yeah. Those who were a part of the family of God, and those who weren't. And those who were a part of the family of God were called Jews, and those who weren't were called Gentiles or pagans. Jerry in Coral Springs, Florida. Hi there. Hello, how you doing? Good, go ahead, sir. Um, I, was, I was wondering, how would a Christian go about getting a proper Hebrew basis for study? Uh, Jerry, that's a good question. Later on, we're going to be giving you an address. Please write to us, and we will send you a... Um, biography or a bibliography of books that will help you uh, get started in your study. But let me say this, and this may come as a burden to you and to everyone else that's listening. The bottom line is learn Hebrew. The key to our understanding of the biblical text, both the Old Testament and the New Testament in its entirety, is Hebrew. That's what I was getting at. Are there tapes available? Uh, we do have a cassette course, yes, uh, consisting of uh, one book and six cassette tapes that is available through the center. All right. We'll be giving that address in a little while. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Memphis, Tennessee. Wade, hello. How you doing, Marlon? Good. Go ahead, sir. I wanted to ask Dr. Blizzard why it seems like most of the archaeological scholars today are liberal and why there are so few uh, conservative Christians involved in digs and the scholarly work. Well, actually, uh, that's not true, Wade. Uh, most of the scholars uh, with whom I am associated, and um, I I'm acquainted with many who are excavating today in Israel, have a tremendous regard for the biblical text. Some of the things that we have found uh, recently in our archaeological discoveries completely revolutionized our understanding of the Bible. Now, you may be speaking, on the one hand, of secular archaeology. Archaeologists and I have been actively involved in that field for myself for a number of years. Was at one time associated with the Paleo Indian Institute at Eastern New Mexico University, and I know uh, a lot about uh, science, anthropology, archaeology, and I know that there is a seeming conflict on one side of the coin between secular archaeologists or anthropologists and uh, theologians. But the basic problem is that theologians are basically uneducated in what the biblical, biblical text is really saying. They're not up with our current discoveries uh, textually and archaeologically in Israel. And I can tell you this as an archaeologist, and I consider myself to be a man of science, that there's absolutely no conflict between any of the archaeological discoveries that we have made anywhere in the world and the biblical text once you correctly know how to read the biblical text and to correctly interpret the find. Thank you, Wade. Thank you. Pat in Mattydale, New York. Hi. Hi. Um, I'd, I'd like to know, where does the name Jesus Christ originate from? And, uh, you know, does, what does it mean? And uh, when the Bible refers to God, uh, some people say that God is Yahweh, or, or is it all those other, you know, the other words to how the Hebrew people... Okay, Pat, hang on, and we'll have Dr. Blizzard answer. Well, Pat, that's a very good question that, again, refers back to the subject of the nature of God. And all of these words that we mentioned, and there are some 30 different names for God that are used in the biblical text, refer simply to some aspect of his being. Uh, if we were to reduce God to one word, and 
try to describe him in just one word, uh, probably the best English word that we could use would be energy. And not that energy is God, but that God is energy, pure life. creative, not just life, but energy, power. Uh, you're this not getting off into a little with, yoga no, saying he's no, the no, force, are no, you? No, 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 no. It's not that God, it's not that energy is God, but that God is omnipotent. Now, in his omnipotence, in his all-powerfulness, he does a lot of things. He manifests himself in many different ways. Are you ways. saying he's not a personal God? Oh, no, not okay. at all, Okay. because that's one of the manifestations of all him. Right. You see, Elohim refers to the creative aspect. Yahweh refers to the covenant aspect, this personal mm -hmm. relationship aspect. Uh, Yehovah Yirapeh, to the healing aspect. Uh, Yehovah Nisi, to the miracle working aspect, and on and on. Dr. Roy Blizzard, my guest. The name of the show is Point of View, and uh, we're going to be talking with him a little bit further about uh, his work with the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. Dr. Roy Blizzard, and you're listening to Point of View, and it's coming to you via satellite from Dallas. <laughs> Again is Marlon. Dr. Roy Blizzard, my guest, he's a specialist on Israel and the Middle East from 1968 to 1974. He was an instructor in Hebrew, biblical history, and biblical archaeology at the University of Texas in Austin. He studied at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he's directed numerous historical archaeological study seminars in Israel. Uh, Roy, you've also got your hands dirty, I guess, doing some of the digging there. Oh, my, not just my hands, top of my head Every, and the bottom of my feet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, before we get... So ask for the free catalog that we have, even if they don't want the book and they're not interested in it, we would be uh, very happy for people uh, if they would write and ask for a free catalog that lists all of the products of books, tapes, videotapes, uh, brochures on the next study seminar that I'm going to be taking to Israel. Uh, all of these things we'd be happy to send to them uh, free. Just well, do you mind if I say just a word briefly about this book? Okay. I, I would like to encourage the people. You can see on the back of the book the scholars that have written just a word here mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the book. And these are some of the top scholars in the world in the field of biblical studies who are without peer. And I believe that this book is so important because it's going to change the direction of all Christian thinking once they begin to see things from a Hebrew perspective. And the purpose of the book is to establish from the archaeological, patristic, uh, historical, etc., uh, background, the fact that Jesus was a Jew, the language of the people was Hebrew, and then the rabbinic method of teaching, and then give examples of how these various passages are illuminated once we're able to see it from a Hebrew perspective. I think it's an important book for them to have in their library. Okay. Let's go back to the lady's uh, question. She was talking about the names of God. And uh, I think you mentioned this 30 different names. Or no, more. So, so the question is, hey, are we talking about 30 separate gods? No, we're talking about one God Attributes, who has characteristics. the capacity okay. to manifest himself. Some, uh, let me give you an illustration. Some people get off uh, all into a religion saying God is love. The Bible says God is love. They turn it around and say love is God. So all i got to have is love. Completely incorrect. Love is simply one of the characteristics. That's Love is not exactly. God. That is a characteristic and not an attribute. Okay. And there's a difference. He has many characteristics. But attribute has to do with his very nature. Right. Uh, and these are reflected in the names. Nowhere is God, uh, is God referred to by name as love. Mm, see, it's true. just God no. is love. Okay. But you have all of these names like uh, Yehovah Yirapeh. Mm -hmm. The uh, God heals, or the healing God, uh, Yehovah uh, Yireh, which I has to do said it better with, myself. with the uh, uh, omniscience of God, the all-knowingness of God. 
El Tzvaot, the ruling or the leading aspect of That doesn't mean the there's Yiddish. another God out there. No, okay, it's referring to the same God who has the capacity to do all of these things. And now this leads us to the subject of, of Jesus in the question that was uh -huh. asked by the young lady okay. in New York. Uh -huh. what, what is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Well, keep in mind again, as I mentioned in Luke chapter uh, 3 and verse 6, that this is simply another name for God, Yeshuat Elohim, just like Adonai Elohim, uh, Yahweh Elohim, El Tzvaot, Adonai Yirape. All of these are in, in construct, what we call construct in Hebrew, and Yeshuat Elohim is just God reconciling or redeeming the world unto himself. This is one of the things that he did, one of his attributes, one of his uh, ways in which he works in and among man. Owasso, Oklahoma. Joe, hi there. Good afternoon, Marlon. Go ahead, sir. I've got uh, Dr. Blizzard's book and enjoy it greatly. Uh, it is a little deep uh, and it's, it does take some study, but that's... Uh, I had to go get my hip boots at break a uh, while ago. Then. <laughs> yeah, it does clear up some questions <laughs> okay. that I had and, and some things that I did not understand. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask Dr. Blizzard, and that is in, in an Old Testament reference, uh, wherein God commanded that a golden idol be, uh, in effect, pulverized and uh, mixed in water, and uh, the, uh, the Isra Israelites drink that. Uh, I have a friend who has some tapes of Dr. Blizzard's, and he told me a bit about that, and I didn't understand it at all. And if Dr. Blizzard could clear that up for me, I'd appreciate it. Okay. I can, and I'd be happy to. It's a very interesting passage of Scripture. But I might ask you, first of all, to get your Bible and turn to the passage so you can see it in context. This is Exodus chapter... Um, 32. Okay, I'm there. I believe. Are, are you there? Let me turn there. And uh, look at verse 19. And you notice it says, As soon as he came near to the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger blazed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hand, and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. And then he took the calf they had made, and he burned it in the fire. He ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites to drink of it. And then he turned to Aaron, and he said, What did you do that you brought this great sin upon these people? And Aaron said, Oh, uh, brother... Uh, I didn't have anything to do with that. You know, the people, they were intent on doing evil, and I didn't know what to do, so I decided we'd just do something religious, and I took up an offering, and uh, then I threw it in the fire, and this calf jumped out. Now, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but if you'll notice in verse number 24, it says, So they gave it to me, speaking of the gold, then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Mm-hmm. You see? Yes, sir. Now, you don't make a golden calf. That is, it's impossible to make a golden calf. You have to take gold, you have to melt it, you have to put it in a mold, and uh, then when it comes out of the mold, you embellish it. But uh, this term make is the Hebrew word asa, which means there's pre-existing material there. If you ask any rabbi what happened here, he will tell you that this calf jumped out of the fire. And, of course, this is uh, the bull god that was commonly worshipped in Egypt, known in Egypt as Apis. And what it says in Hebrew literally is, And I threw it in the fire, and this calf jumped out. And we've never really understood the power that the devil has to deceive, nor how deeply ingrained all... You're saying Aaron actually believed that. Uh, it, it wasn't it was that he not... believed it. it. It actually happened. Okay, you're saying it's a demonstration of demonic power uh, that it actually exactly happened? exactly what happened. The calf jumped out and says, here I am. You remember me from way back down there in Egypt? Hey, Dr. Blizzard, was there not some reference on your tape to the color... Yes, now this is what I wanted to get into. Now notice what happens here. Uh, Moses takes this calf, he uh, beats it until it is his finest flour, scatters it on the water, and makes the people a drink of it. Now why would he do that? You see, this thing that was the instrument of the devil was also the instrument of sacrifice for the children of Israel. 
the offering up of the sin offering for the atonement of sins, the shedding of blood. And you remember, without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. Now, the technical term for flower-fine gold mingled with water is called colloidal gold. And you know what happens when you put flower-fine gold in water? Mm -mm. It turns the water blood red. Wow. And uh, have you ever heard of gold glass? Mm -hmm. Gold glass is red, a brilliant red, because mm. of the refraction. You're saying of the there, light. there was a redemptive message That's in what right. you're talking about? That's right. You see about? what happens here. And the interesting parallel is that those who drank were forgiven, and those who refused to drink were cut off. Mm -hmm. 3,000 were cut off on that day. But remember, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. You're saying uh, if, if the Jew would look at the historical events such as that, and this, again, would be a prophecy of the shedding of Jesus' blood? It's all a type. A type. A type of, of what was something going to come. later on is the antitype. Thank you, Joe. And Charles in Arlington. Hi. Hi. <laughs> what is a... That the, what is it that the scribes and Pharisees objected to when they, when Jesus said, I'm son of God, when he was saying son of man, uh, when they was asking him when, during the trial? What is it that they made him tear his robes? Which, which are his words? Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, what happened was when he stood before them, you remember, just prior to his crucifixion, they said, tell us who you are said, are you uh, the Christ? And he said, I've told you a dozen times, and I'm not going to tell you anymore, but this one thing I am going to tell you, that from this day forward, you're going to see the Son of Man, referring back to Daniel 6, or 7, 13 and 14, seated at the right hand of God in glory. And this is a reference back to one of the Psalms that talks about the Lord says to my Lord, set thou on my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. And so what he's really saying is that I'm going to make you my footstool. You're listening to Point of View. My guest this afternoon is uh, Dr. Roy Blizzard. He's uh, with the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. And uh, they say Jesus spoke Hebrew. He lived solely within the Jewish culture of first century Israel. And uh, even the New Testament is essentially a Jewish document. We're talking about that. And we'll do some more right after this. Dr. Roy Blizzard, my guest. Roy, do you... Uh, you travel back and forth to Israel? Yes. Uh, quite often? Uh, yes, Marlon. As a matter of fact, I just returned from there a few weeks ago. I will be going again on a special historical and archaeological study seminar that I'll be personally guiding and directing uh, the 1st of May. I'm over there anywhere from three to five times a year, either uh, leading seminars, in seminars, research, or uh, on business of one kind or another. Do you, uh, do you have contact uh, with the Jewish scholars? Oh, yes, do absolutely. You? And this is one thing that's so exciting about the work of the Center is that we're bringing together not just Christian scholars, okay. but the top Jewish scholars in the world in the various fields of historical, textual, archaeological studies. Uh, one of the top young uh, scholars in Israel uh, at the Hebrew University, senior lecturer in uh, archaeology at the Hebrew University, is uh, writing a new uh, book on uh, Palestinian archaeology for uh, the center. Uh, these scholars uh, all appeared on a, a recent a television series that we did for Trinity Broadcasting Network called The Quest. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm talking about the cream of scholarship in, in these various fields of study. Two, two questions. Uh, can your Hebrew scholars learn anything from Christians, and can the Christians learn anything from your Hebrew scholars? Well, I mean, we have been talking uh, to each other for uh, generations. Th that's, that's the tragedy, and actually the fault uh, lies principally with the Christian. Why? For the simple reason that he is almost totally ignorant of uh, Jewish 
uh, background, culture, mentality, the Hebrew language, uh, of the, shall we say, the historical foundations of the faith. Christianity. And mm -hmm. we have been trying to talk to them from the perspective of a Gentile religion that they're not interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas we have to educate and inform ourselves to where we can begin to relate to them from the perspective of the historical foundations of our faith from a Jewish background, from a Hebraic perspective. In, uh, in the last few years, uh, many in the Jewish government, uh, as well as other knowledgeable Jews around the world, all of a sudden woke up to the fact that probably the greatest friends they have in the West is the evangelical Christian, because the Christian still believes that uh, Jesus came from this culture and that there is still prophetic and covenant significance to the land of Israel itself. Uh, do you sense this? Yes, um, and I hate to, to say this because it's opening up a whole different can of worms. That's true on one side of the coin. But on the other side of the coin is that there are a great many uh, knowledgeable Jews, those in government, and those in uh, scholarly circles who are very much afraid of what they see taking place in some circles in fundamental or evangelical Christianity today. Such as? A couple of things. Uh, those who are uniting together with the uh, little uh, radical splinter groups in Israel to blow up the Dome of the Rock so oh, that they can rebuild okay. the temple and who are collecting money all uh, over the country for yeah. the rebuilding of the yeah. temple, making all kinds of helping, exaggerated... Helping God uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, trying to assist the Messiah in his yeah. coming. Yeah, I, I would agree with the Jews on that. That's dangerous. Tupelo, Mississippi, and Jim, hello. Hello, Jim. Let's see. No, let me talk to Angel. Jim, I'll get to you in a minute. Carthage, Missouri. Yes, uh, Brother Marlin and Dr. Blizzard. I'm enjoying this so much. Uh, I have always had my ideas of uh, who the Holy Ghost was uh, in the Trinity, you know, and um, I've always felt that uh, I myself, uh, and it might sound a little far-fetched for a lot of people or radical, but in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, he said when we would be changed. And I've always felt that when I received my spiritual sight, that I would be able to see everything and understand all mysteries just like Jesus himself. And that I would see a third person in the Godhead, uh, the Holy Ghost, with a form as the three persons in the one, in the Trinity Godhead. Uh, going over to the 12th chapter of... You make this, uh, we're getting into a long theological discussion and... Uh, I just wanted to ask him one question uh, okay. about who this person is, where it says in the 31st verse, for all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto him. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, and you said a while ago about the Son of, you know, okay, what, what, uh, Angel, what is your question? Who is this Holy Ghost? It, you cannot speak against the Holy Ghost. You <laughs> Angel, hang on. All right, we got your question. I think that lady needs three hours a day. Go ahead, Roy. Well, actually, her question is, uh, what's uh, blasphemy against the Holy Holy Spirit? Yeah. Uh, and she did open a bag of worms uh, that uh, I really don't want to get into uh, because of time. But again, it has to do with the nature of God. You see, mm -hmm. as Christians, we've never really understood the nature of God. Right. We've never understood the nature of the devil. The Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, Ruach Elohim, is simply another name for God. It's another one of his attributes that has to do with the empowering aspect of deity. Let's go to Tupelo, Mississippi, and Jim. Uh, Marlon, I met you in Columbus, Mississippi. Yeah, we had a good time there, didn't we? Yes, and I just want to say God bless you and your ministry, and we really appreciate you. You've really been a blessing to us here in Tupelo. You're very kind, sir. Thank you. The program today is really interesting, and I'd like to ask Dr. Blizzard uh, one question. Uh, because of your uh, interviews with Constance Cumbie, Marlin, and her uh, tapes that I, I picked up in Columbus, I've really become interested in the New Age movement and, and uh, the second coming of Christ and how that a lot of Christians might be deceived. Uh, 
by the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. but I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Blizzard that in his studies, has he gained an, an understanding of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, verse 29, at, that immediately after the tribulation of these days that he would appear, and then um, the tribulation itself of uh, Matt, uh, Revelations 20, verse 4, of those people who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus who didn't. Okay, I'll tell you what, you're, you're digging us into a pretty big hole here. If we can just settle it to one brief question, Jim. A matter of time. Okay, well then the question of the second coming of Christ, uh, is he, uh, in his studies, has he uh, learned something that might help us to be prepared there? Okay, hang up and uh, we'll release your line and have him comment. Yes, we've learned a great deal. And again, it uh, revolutionizes our understanding of the subject. The fact is that Jesus had very little to say about his coming again. And uh, much of the information that we're hearing today by so-called prophecy teachers is nothing more than pure uh, sensationalism and prognostication, again, trying to assist the Lord in his return. The message of Jesus is that the Son of Man is going to come as a thief in the night. No man knows the day nor the hour, and the message to the body of believers is be ready. Okay. Because in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay, let's go to Irving, Texas. Steve. Hello, Steve. Hello, Marlon. Uh, I've been very intrigued with the program so far. Uh, I'm a student of New Testament Greek. I've got a degree in New Testament Greek, and I'm currently working on a second degree on a master's level. Um, I've got a question about a statement that Dr. Blizzard had made earlier. Okay. Uh, he had said that the at least the synoptic gospels had originally been written. Steve, I want to give you all the time I can, but we are running short. So if you could uh, make it real brief. Okay. Um, and I've studied textual criticism quite thoroughly. And if he could show me in any theological journal, anywhere documented evidence that we have scraps or manuscripts uh, of the any of the gospels or any of the new testament that was written in hebrew i'd be very interested in seeing that because i've never seen that or even heard about that well uh again uh jim or uh, what steve steve uh, -huh. uh we don't have any fragments of any manuscripts uh, as we as you know if you've studied greek we don't even have any fragments of greek manuscripts that go back uh past the uh, second century uh all of our uh, greek uh, texts that we have of the uh, uh, Old Testament and uh, New Testament uh, are from the uh, fourth century. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to suggest that you do is write to us and let us send you the information that you can read because uh, we have this uh, very thoroughly documented and without taking up a lot of the uh, time that's remaining, just write us. We'll send you the material and I guarantee you that uh, if you've got any further questions, you can write to us. We'll answer them for you. Thank you, Steve. I'm out of time. And uh, when you get to talk in Hebrew and Greek and so on, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm not a scholar. So I'd love to hear a man like Steve and you get down to the nitty-gritty and talk about some of these things sometime. Thank you so much for being with us. And my guest uh, this afternoon has been Dr. Roy Blizzard. He's head of research for the Center for Judaic Christian Studies. Tomorrow...